together. It's kind of the next implementation or next upgrade, I'd say, to a uh, different code base, but to Whisper. So um, having a gossip net ne network on Whisper is super important. And um, it'll also be, I think, able to be in uh, incorporated into Ethereum as well as Polkadot. So give it up for the, the messaging panel. I'll let them introduce themselves individually. Okay, great. So now we're going to do something that is a bit different, both with regard to the format and also a bit with regard to the topic. So you've been listening to people giving talks all day, so we thought you might want to have something different. Instead of having one person talking, you're now going to have four person people talking. So this is the session with the highest chance that people will start fighting and throwing insults at each other. <laughs> but actually, I hope that's not going to happen. Also, we're going to talk a lot about um, privacy and not so much about blockchain now. So what we hope is that at the end of the session, you will have a good overview of what are different, um, what is kind of vague privacy area actually means. What are the key terms that we're interested in? And how does that relate to what we're planning to do? So I'm Stephanie. I'm an assistant professor at TU Delft in the Netherlands. And I'm now going to introduce all of our panel speakers very quickly. And then we're going to dig into the content. So I'm going to start with Sebastian, who is the CTO at Vality Labs and is working on implementations regarding anonymous messaging. Then we have Oscar from Stereo, and he is more on the engineering side than on the research side of the messaging protocols. We have Harry from NIM and Andrea, who has a very, uh, who has a, an interest in privacy enhancing technologies in general and on blockchain based one in particular and for Tema from the web 3 foundation who until very recently did a phd on privacy preserving distributed systems at Kyo Durban. so these four people are going to help us to get a better understanding on what is messaging what is anonymous messaging how does it relate to blockchain? And what are the key components that we want to use? So let's start with something that is really high level. We all know messaging apps, such as Signal, maybe on the privacy preserving side, but most of you are probably using WhatsApp, maybe right now. <laughs> so why do we need a new decentralized messaging protocol? And maybe even going a step Further back, what actually do you mean when you say messaging? Who wants to start? That should work, right? Yeah, so I think it's, it's maybe let's look back in this, in this blockchain context. I, I still remember at, at DEF CON 1, at Ethereum DEF CON 1, we, we heard that Ethereum actually comprises three layers. One of them was a blockchain, the next one was messaging, and the third one was storage, right? So, and then, then kind of Whisper and Swarm, which was pillar two and three, were, were kind of um, consequently being a little bit cut down, if I may say so. But one thing that we've seen is what is needed is, for example, if you have a transaction in the blockchain context, you want to broadcast that, right? You want other peers to know that you have signed a transaction, and maybe some of them includes that in a block, what I would call broadcasting. And that's what Whisper was originally designed to do. And then we see also applications which are more in the kind of point-to-point -point communication, like you said initially for... Um, yeah, for, for example, messaging apps between two people. And if you, well, apply, if you apply Whisper um, um, to this point-to-point -point communication, that might not be such a good idea. So that's maybe starting to get into that, you know, know your tools. 
And yeah, I think Status has, has some experience on, on your past, right, doing that. Uh, sure. So first, I'll talk briefly about sort of secure messaging, because that's kind of what we're doing here. And what is it? Like, like you can start with very basic things, like end-to-end -end encryption, which is sort of becoming the very basic standard that most uh, messaging apps for end users actually implement. But then you have more interesting properties like perfect forward secrecy, uh, post-compromise uh, post security, and these types of things. But all of these are kind of at the... Um, conversational security layer. And, and one way of looking at secure messaging in general is to break it apart into different, different orthogonal pieces. So you could think of like trust establishment, which is how do you know that who you're talking to is actually the right person? So that in terms of guarding against uh, manual middle attacks and these types of things. And then you have conversational security, which is what most people think of, which is like end-to-end -end encryption and uh, forward secrecy and these types of things. And then you can also think of sort of transport privacy where this is maybe something that's, that would set a product like this apart from something like Signal, where you also you look at privacy as a security feature. So you want to protect the metadata. Uh, and we can, we'll go into that a bit more in, in detail, what that actually uh, means in terms of send anonymity, receive anonymity, and unlinkability, and so on. Um, so I guess, yeah, I can talk briefly about sort of Whisper and where we are coming at. Uh, because, so status right now, we are, we are using Whisper in production, uh, have been for quite a while, and I think we're probably the biggest user of Whisper right now. Um, this panel is called Whisper version 2, which is a bit of a misnomer, because as uh, Sebastian was saying, uh, Whisper is sort of broadcast-based, and it's not really the same type of protocol. What we are looking to develop here is more something point-to-point. -point. I guess at status, one mistake we made earlier is that we, we assumed that Whisper was this protocol that we were going to use, and then we, and we use it and build up an app. Um, but it's not really the right semantics in terms of having reliable communication, uh, either if it's one-on-one -on -one chat or private group chat and so on. And uh, there's lots of sort of mistakes we made in terms of trying to retrofit the right behavior we want on top of Whisper and so on. Um, I can talk a bit more about that later, but maybe someone else wants to say. You want to discuss yeah, it might be a good idea. I guess we now talked a bit about Whisper as it is now. It's not what we actually want, because if you're really thinking about messaging to one other person or to a small group, you do not want to broadcast everything to everyone. But what are the advantages of being decentralized? in comparison to having something like Signal, which has end-to-end -end encryption, but via a centralized server. Fatima, do you want to talk about that? So the mm. idea we have is to um, provide privacy-preserving pres communication, and once you have centralized um, control over the communication, it is very difficult to provide that privacy preservation against that central authority, whoever that is. Um, so, going back to what um, uh, Oscar mentioned last, protecting the metadata, basically protecting who, where a message is or originated and where it is going to go, so the source and the destination, um, that is the, the basically the, the key goal that we have here. Um, and just encrypting the message, uh, like Signal does, or so, like a lot of uh, communications do, it does hide the content of the communication, so you, do not, you do, not, do not know what is written inside or what is said, but you still would know where it has originated and where it has um, landed in the end. And sometimes just knowing these two points is enough to even guess what is the content of that communication. So in order to uh, uh, provide truly privacy-preserving communication, just encrypting it like Signal does or many other uh, apps do is not enough because just knowing the endpoints um, would reveal a lot of the content already. Um, and then when we talk about sender or receiver anonymity, sender anonymity basically means that um, when a message is sent, you, don't, you, don't, you do not know where it has been originated. Now the question is <clears throat> whether this anonymity or this privacy preservation is against the communication parties or just an external entity. Um, receiver anonymity is the other uh, aspect of it. So basically it means that 
um, a receiver would not reveal who he is when he is re receiving a, a message. So yeah, that's the basic what we have. So, so I think it, it's good to separate these two levels a bit. So you want, you want some sort of privacy preserving messaging, uh, and you have you know, the network stack, and you have the application stack. So I'm gonna talk first about the network stack and then a little bit about the application stack. So the application is the thing which the user actually sees, which is sending messages on top of the network stack, but the network stack itself, which is the actual packets going back and forth, TCP, IP, U, UDP, whatever, can also reveal this metadata, reveal who's talking to who. So, so for example, with Signal, or with WhatsApp or any other centralized service, if I'm sending messages up to the Signal server and down, if I'm an adversary and I'm not very powerful, I say, oh, well, there's some encrypted internet traffic going on, I might be able to figure out who it's going to. But if I'm, for example, a powerful adversary, such as anyone like the NSA or anyone who works at Amazon who can observe the AWS cluster that Signal's using, I can observe all the uplink traffic and all the downlink traffic and I can observe the size, the patterns of the packets being sent up and down, and the timing of those patterns, the timing. And that these, th this is enough to really de-anonymize a lot of communication, even if the sender and the receiver are not explicitly attached as, you know, uh, plain text, additional data on top of like an encrypted AAD packet. So, so that's enough by itself. Even if your packet is somehow perfectly encrypted, the metadata is enough to get you in trouble. And, you know, and there's also a lot of operational issues with uh, centralization. So, for example, if I'm in a place, you know, let's say I'm in, uh, you know, Rojava, like Amir Taki, I'm fighting ISIS. All of a sudden, the internet gets cut, which happened uh, when last time Turkey invaded. And um, all of a sudden, my si signal stops working. I can't, um, I can't send messages because I can't get to that Amazon cluster behind signal. So, I think what we, there's been a lot of advances. Uh, the main thing that I think most people think of and think of network level anonymity is Tor. So you say, okay, well, I'm going to jump into this kind of peer-to-peer -peer network, and I'm going to hop. I'm going to take one hop to, some, uh, to the entry node, another hop, and the exit node, I'm exiting out, and there's three hops, or maybe more if you or so, so decide, uh, basically enough to mask my IP address. And maybe I can even hop to something inside the Tor network, like a hidden service, and then you know, there's all sorts of weird stuff that happens in hidden services, and you know, you can have, and, and that helps it re, uh, provide additional anonymity. But the problem uh, with Tor is there's two problems, and maybe you can discuss it more if you want. One is that, uh, so Tor, even though the relays, the things that you bounce your traffic around, um, are effectively a peer-to-peer -peer network, the who is in the network at any given time, like the PKI, you want to call it, perhaps, um, that, that's controlled by a centralized directory authority system, um, which is basically established by the Tor project and is kind of the friends of the Tor project, Roger's friends, effectively. Uh, so that's a weak point, and that weak point was attacked by Lizard Squad, I think, a few years ago during Chaos Computer Congress, and taken out at a certain point. And this causes problems with rooting. Um, the second problem, which I think is a little bit more fundamental to Tor, which also affects VPNs, is the threat model is a little bit weird, right? So the threat model says, well, if you have some local adversary, and you go in this peer-to-peer -peer network, maybe you'll come out on another end. And this is also an issue, this is a general assumption of peer-to-peer -peer networks. It's kind of a security by obscurity argument. You're basically saying, if the peer-to-peer the -peer network's big enough, the adversary can only observe a small part of it. And as soon as I get inside that network, then maybe the adversary can't tell when I'm coming out. But the problem is today, uh, with the vast expansions of computing power we have, adversaries often can observe the whole network, and particularly for high value networks like uh, cryptocurrency transactions, Bitcoin, Ethereum. And, and I think there's the, the alternative design to Tor, which is what uh, the NIM project's working on, which is what we've also been working on in Inria with the uh, Panoramics project, is that it's called a mixed network. And the mixed network adds three things, not, you know, different mixed networks add uh, to, to Tor. When the packets come in, they are, because it's a mixed network, they're mixed. It's not Bitcoin tumbling. It's the packets are actually kind of randomly permuted, and then they're shipped to another mixed node, and they're randomly permuted again. So that helps defeat patterns 
in the traffic. You also can add a delay, a timing delay, uh, to your mixed network enabled traffic. That timing delay breaks these attacks or someone's looking at the, you know, if I talk, if I send a packet at the signal, and then a few seconds later, a packet goes down to you. If there's a delay there, maybe someone else sends a packet, another packet comes out, it's hard to distinguish what packet I sent. So this delay is quite useful. The third thing is dummy traffic. Uh, Tor does not, I mean, they're considering it, but they don't add any kind of cover traffic or fake traffic into the mix. And so we've actually, this month, dummy traffic was originally viewed as too expensive when Tor was kind of booting up in the early days of the internet. Uh, but now the internet's much more high capacity. So mixed networking projects like Lupix is probably designed with the most advanced cover traffic um, work really al allow you to really, if a third party adversary, even as powerful as, for example, the NSA, has complete, a complete view of your network, the combination of mixing the messages with timing delays and dummy traffic essentially allow the distribution of traffic between each node to remain more or less constant appearing to the adversary, which then gives you a very high level of anonymity, much better than Tor. So my personal hope is that some of these concepts, even though they're not really pioneered within a peer-to-peer -peer setting, Lupix has a more client-server setting, but we can use some of these concepts that have been developed in mixed networks and apply them to the peer-to-peer -peer setting. Okay, I guess now we a bit at a point where we introduced what is not working so well with centralized services, and then Harry already talked about a lot of the alternatives. Why is Tor not what we're looking for as well? So now we should probably talk about what are we looking for? What are the ideas? What do you want to do with these mixed networks that up to now have never been used in a peer-to-peer -peer context? and make it so that now we can use them as real peer-to-peer -peer systems and not as partially centralized systems such as the Tor network. Do you want to start? Uh, I, I would just like to st uh, take a step back a bit again, because mm -hmm. uh, I think this is an Ethereum conference, so a lot of you guys are probably familiar with uh, Whisper. Just want to show of hands, like how, how many people know how Whisper works the way it currently... All right, a few people. Um, so, 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 so uh, just briefly sort of how, how Whisper works, because this is of still the name of this, um, this panel and might provide some kind of contrast to what we're going to talk about next. So uh, Whisper is broadcast-based. Uh, it's a sub-protocol of uh, dev P2P. So the way it works is you connect to some, you have some bootstrap nodes and you connect to a random subset of nodes. Um, and the way to look at it, you can either look at it as kind of like a messaging system or you can look at it as a, as a value store, a DHT with ephemeral values that have some kind of time to live. So you essentially, you, you create a message and you do some proof of work to send it out to a network. And then each node, they relay it uh, to other nodes. And then you use, also use this uh, topics where you sort of signal what you're interested in. So here are the, the, the thing, topics I'm interested in, and then you can combine these into a Bloom filter. Um, this is not an essential part of, of Whisper because by default, you're sending messages to all the nodes, which is not great from a scalability point of view because uh, you're sending messages to some node and another node and then you can get duplicate messages and so on. Um, so one way of combating this is having these kind of bloom filters where you say these are only messages I'm interested in. Uh, but what that does is it leaks uh, a lot of sort of metadata because you, you're saying here's the things I'm interested in. And I guess also, so there's the, the theoretical whisper, which is this thing where you have a lot of bandwidth and not, not much latency, which provides some kind of receive anonymity because you send all these messages around and then only the person who has the actual uh, key, whether it's symmetric key or, or uh, asymmetric cryptography, they can actually decrypt the message. So you don't know who a message is for. Uh, but in practice, like for example, we use uh, mobile devices and, and you, can't, you need to have a pretty tight bloom filter in order not to be overwhelmed by bandwidth usage. Um, and um, you can't really relay all the messages just because the network uh, consumption is, is horrendous. Um, I guess another thing also, which is this proof of work aspect, which is a great construct with something like Bitcoin or Ethereum or something. Proof of stake is obviously better, but uh, with proof of work for this type of thing with heterogeneous devices, it's not very useful uh, because it's always going to be very, very expensive to do it on, on a... Uh, 
uh, mobile device compared to doing it on a, on a sort of regular computer. Um, so your phone just heats up and so on. So, so we need other types of, of constructs to deal with spam and these types of things. So that's, that's another aspect uh, which you run into uh, sort of in the real world. And um, going back to how Harry was saying that one way of looking at anonymity is to sort of have these different properties you can play with. So you have latency and bandwidth, and then you anonymity set the number of people using uh, your system. And you can play with these parameters in order to have some some guarantee that this no, these two people talking are not, um, that is sort of, you, 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 you can't pinpoint uh, that these two people are talking. Maybe it's like, well, the, out of these million people, we know that some people are talking. You know, you know someone's using a system, but you don't know that two people within, uh, that, that are talking. And that also ties into sort of the um, timing attacks and so on, where if you have latency to play with as a, as a, as a, as a parameter, it means that you can, you can sort of disappear in the sea. Uh, and similar with, when it comes to bandwidth and cover traffic and these types of things. Um, that was not your original question, but just wanted to sort of provide some bit more grounding on whisper and so on. Uh, yeah, that might be a good yeah. point here. Cool. Uh, so the original question yeah. was, we now established some of the key terms, and you just helped establishing some more by, by explaining how exactly Whisper works. So we've seen that there are a couple of issues, both with the centralized solutions and the existing decentralized solutions. So let's talk a bit about building blocks that you want to have in your solution, in your working, fully anonymous, fully decentralized messaging system. Yeah, let, let me jump in here. So um, we're at Validity Labs working on an implementation that uh, might serve some or hopefully as much as possible of, of these requirements, right? And we call it Hopper. Um, and at Hopper, we're thinking, okay, this, we, we heard now these, these problems uh, that Harry nicely described of Tor, for example, right? And the other thing is like, how many nodes do you actually have there? And to, to underline this, this problem a bit, let's do a short experiment. I mean, we had this crypto conference here. Are there any people in the room that were ever mining any sort of crypto assets? Okay, so I see about like a quarter or a third or so. Um, how many of you guys ha are running or have ever been running a Tor node? I see a few hands, that's good. That's more than I expected. Uh, why would nobody else of you like run a Tor node? Like you're mining, you had like all your, your GPUs and all your crazy power consumption. I mean, you went through quite some trouble for that, but why aren't you running Tor? Well, why would you, right? So the thing is, there is not much in for that and there's an absolutely non-zero legal risk. And if you, if you check out Tor and, and read what, like some, some how-tos, you, you come into this legal explanations that maybe you should proactively like contact your ISP and be nice to them. And if you're at university, you should also explain it to them, which is all fair and square. But this is a totally non-zero cost, right? So what we say, and, and I know that there's some people that, that don't agree with us on that, is we say, if we want to run truly decentralized networks that can run at global scale for things like WeChat or, or you know, any sort of messaging mainstream applications, we need a very different scale from what we have today, where we have a few hundreds to a few thousands of these nodes and specifically exit nodes in Tor. So for that, we need to incentivize these guys, right? So if you want to run this thing, just like you are incentivized to run a miner, you should be incentivized to run a relay node in, for example, a hopper network. And of course, now there's there's a naive implementation, right, where you can where where I can I can just get paid for relaying your messages. But the problem is this would totally de-anonymize your um, your messaging layer, and you're back to square one. So um, yeah, having a payment layer that does not de-anonymize your messaging layer is is basically of of importance. And specifically, how we approach that, you can find out on Thursday afternoon. I have a talk. Briefly, um, we, we leverage payment channels. It's a little bit sophisticated payment channels that um, need cooperation from the next downstream node in order to get my payout so that I cannot just, you know, not relay your messages but take all your money. So that's, that's the gist of it, I would say. So again, incentivization for the 
critical network infrastructure is in our eyes one important aspect that we are trying to implement with Hopper. And uh, for some other interesting aspects, who wants to take over? So, so I mean, so one open question which uh, Valet Labs is working on, and you know, is is how would you pay for these mixed nodes, or how would you pay for these Hopper nodes or these Whisper nodes in general? And I think that's a very important question. There's also some basic questions of of what does it mean to to, to send a message, and what security properties and privacy properties. Do you want for a message? So how many people here have used Signal, WhatsApp, I don't know. How many people here are Signal users? Okay, how many people here have tried to use a Signal group? Okay, how many people have tried to remove somebody from a Signal group? Okay, you can't do it. Yeah, so, so there's all these, the, 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 the interesting thing um, with a lot of group messaging apps is the question is, you know, when, you, when we first started looking at messaging, we, we didn't really, there wasn't a really sophisticated design, for example, in PGP for groups. I just take a symmetric key, maybe I, I, I encrypted everyone's uh, public asymmetric key, and then I give them that symmetric key, and then they can decrypt the message. And that's, that's amazing, and that kind of works for PGP. But the fact of the matter is that, let's say I send a message to like, you know, um, some sketchy person, and he takes that symmetric key, and then he, gives it to his friend, right? They gives it to them like sketchy guy from Google. And all of a sudden, that guy can read all my messages, right? So one way you, and he, not only can he read all my messages, he can read all my messages into the indefinite future and all my past messages. So the main, the main thing that kind of signal protocol provided was this sort of double ratchet mechanism, which basically says every time we send a message back and forth, we're gonna give you, we're gonna kind of generate a new key and we're gonna authenticate and that lets us basically provide so that if the key is intercepted at any point, you can't read my previous messages and you can't read my future messages. But the, the problem with the signal protocol is that it's not clear how to scale that to large groups. That's why it's very easy to, people, most people for large groups use Telegram or something. They don't use signal. And, and the reason is because signal really is designed as a one-to-one -one protocol. You know, I'm sending a message to him, he's sending a message to me, kind of based off of off-the-record messaging in, in the sort of generic way. And when you start scaling, then I basically have a message, I want to send it to you, that if I want to send it to a group, the group, it currently signal, I either just, I do another ratchet with you, and maybe a third ratchet with you. But the problem with that way of sending messages is what if I send one message to you, and we're in a group together, all four of us, but then I encrypt a different message and send it to him, right? And he can't tell, right? That's pretty bad. So we want to prevent that, any kind of future messaging design. Also, it's, it seems to be pretty inefficient that I'm re-encrypting the same message and doing this ratchet game with all these different people over and over again. That's not very efficient. So uh, there's new work at the Internet Engineering Task Force on a new protocol called Message Layer Security which basically, even though it's not a blockchain protocol, basically uses a Merkle tree uh, in order to say, well, the group, a group is not defined by people who ratchet messages to each other, but it's defined by access to a common group secret. So I, send, I have a access to a group secret that proves I'm in the group, and then when I send the message, it's broadcast to everyone in the same group, and that group is defined by access to the group secret, and then, you use a Merkle tree, so we're all leaves of a big Merkle tree, and there's some top node up there. And every time I send a message that ratchets to, up to the top node, that top node sends the message down to everyone, and then we ratchet that group secret. So the group secret changes with every message. So we get the nice properties that Signal doesn't provide, which is uh, it's scalable. We think it scales at least to like 50,000 nodes pretty easily. And uh, it keeps the group has some level of authenticity. But what, what we've sort of left out of this design, which is something a lot of people want, is this other concept, which maybe I'll let someone else explain, um, called deniability. So I don't know if you want to go into deniability. Yeah, sure. um, so the idea of deniability is that um, originally in a lot of peer-to-peer -peer systems, when a message was uh, being passed along uh, nodes, um, the, the node that is receiving a message would not know that the previous 
sender was the original sender of the, of the message or just an intermediate node. And that would give some sort of deniability. So if, um, if I'm sending a, a, a message and the next sender cannot know whether it's, it was me who, se who, origi who, who sent them, uh, there is no way to prove that I was the original sender or I was just someone who is passing it along, I have some sort of deniability. It's a very weak uh, sort of privacy because of course if this is occurring um, a lot of times, so if every time that Bob is, uh, is getting a message, I am one of the um, intermediaries. Um, it, there is a probability that I was the sender, but uh, it gives some sort of a, a weak uh, privacy preserving um, property, but it's not considered a strong uh, property generally. But that was one of the very early ways to provide some sort of uh, privacy preserving communication in peer-to-peer -peer settings. Essentially, the deniability is great if you're in a court scenario and someone has to prove that you're the one sent a that sent a message, then you will, then deniability will get you out. If you're in an oppressive regime and nobody cares if there is any decent um, court situation or if the few suspicion that you did something can p get you into trouble, deniability will not solve, save you. So this is where we want anonymity to summarize that in context. And, and, and also, you know, it, it, if we really want anonymity plus decentralization, like these designs, like the signal design and the message layer security design, and even the mixnet design, we don't have fully decentralized working versions of any of them. And so there's all sorts of problems. Well, I'm trying to make a group with these three people here, but let's say Oscar disappears for a while, which happens not only, you know, happens to nodes all the time in peer-to-peer uh, -peer systems, what happens to that group secret? Do we keep updating it? And how do we fix it when Oscar reappears? And these sort of questions, these sort of questions of concurrency and decentralization are questions that really need a lot more work in order to get all of these properties. So you want to be encrypted, you want to be anonymous, but you also really want to be kind of reliable. You don't want messages to just sort of disappear into the ether every time you send them. Uh, yes, I think that's a really important point when it comes to peer-to-peer -peer systems and messaging specifically is the fact that we don't have the same availability assumptions. Like if you have some centralized messaging service, you can, you can figure out, you can have a server, you have some kind of load balancing, you can get nine sigma reliability, whatever. Like that's, it's, it's kind of, it's a solved problem, but this becomes much more hairy when we're talking about peer-to-peer -peer messaging. And you, it's, probably, it's probably too expensive to stick all your messages on some blockchain, or whatever, or you're always available. So how do you sort of solve this problem? Um, so there's a few ways. One, one thing we started exploring at Status is um, sort of similar to how you build TCP on top of IP to get sort of reliability uh, semantics, uh, you can do something similar with data synchronization. And the idea there is that you have a bunch of nodes and they have sort of their own view of the world. They have sort of a log of their, of, of their own messages. And then you append to your own local log and then you, you sort of sync up with other nodes in some group context. Uh, so this would be, for example, uh, the nodes within some group, or it might also be some helper nodes that sort of s stay online. Because another problem is that if you're on a mobile device, um, you're mostly offline, right? So if you talk to someone and, and you, you're both offline, then how do you actually get messages to the, to the other node? Um, and there's different ways of sort of dealing with that. But, but the idea with, with uh, data synchronization is that you get some form of reliability semantics, and you, you get some assurances that the other person actually gets the message, even though they might, they might be delayed. So it's some kind of like, you offer some message and then you have acknowledgements and retransmissions uh, and these types of things. And, and when it comes to these, this thing about sort of how you deal with key rotation, it's kind of a subtle matter. And it's an app called um, Briar and they have a Brambo protocol. And what they do is that you sort of negotiate in advance what your assumptions are in terms of when you come online. So maybe, Maybe you are sort of in the jungle somewhere and you don't even use the internet to sync up. You're using the sneaky net in Cuba or whatever. You can still have a protocol that deals with these types of situations where you sort of say, well, you have forward secrecy, but you have some ratchet. So you, it's, you do key rotation every, every few weeks or whatever. So it's possible to, to think about these things, but you need to sort of allow for it in, in the protocol design and have same defaults and maybe some negotiation mechanism around that. I can make one quick point. So, so one aspect uh, of a, a newer mixnet design called Lupix that uh, 
NIM project and folks have, and Panoramics have implemented is that historically, we actually had mixed networks a little bit like in the late 90s on the, like the cypherpunk mailing list. Uh, sort of, there's this problem where people kept you know, wanting to send anonymous messages. Uh, and the problem with sending anonymous messages is that why, everyone's like, why didn't these really take off? Why did Tor take off and mixed networks didn't? And the reason in the 90s, one of the reasons it didn't take off is, you know, you, you're, you want to send an anonymous message, but you never know if that message got received. You would kind of send the message into a black box, it would hang out for a few hours, a few days. You never know if the guy at the other end got it, right? So that's the problem, a very simple problem that you have in anonymous messaging is you might want, just like you have a TCP IP and most other things, some sort of receipt that the message got delivered. So the main, I guess, new development in mixed networking, or one of the more interesting ones over the last few years, has been this concept of the loop, the loop and loopix, which basically you send an anonymous message through the network, it drops off, and then it kind of loops back. Because it, the, the loop back is also covered by the anonymous network, that loop back is anonymized, but it doesn't need to be anonymized to the person that sent the original packet. So they basically, even though the receiver gets an anonymized packet, a third party can't really tell who sent the packet because there's a bunch of packets and dummy traffic going around, I can tell if my packet got delivered. So they, these sort of reliability notions end up being, they're not abstract, they're actually what kills or doesn't kill somewhat like incentive structure as a protocol in terms of real world usage. Yeah, uh, be, be, before getting more into incentives, I would like to mention some things that, that we had uh, talked about here, but which, which might not, not have been so clear, that we have this fundamental trade-off, right? So if we design uh, any sort of messaging applications, and I think for an application developer, it's like many here, it's important to be aware of that, that we have this fundamental trade-off um, of throughput and privacy. Right? So if you want messages to get super fast to some party, you will not have very high privacy. If you want super large packages of data to get relatively quickly to some party, you will also not have really good privacy. Right? So you will get privacy if you're willing to accept some sort of latency and if you're willing to accept some sort of you know, overhead traffic. So let's say if I'm willing to, to accept like a, a few seconds of latency and, and that there's, there's a, little, a bunch of traffic that somebody sends around, that, that is fine, right? That, that is covering me. So, so always like whatever we build, we have to be aware of that, what we're, what we're really aiming, aiming for. And ideally, uh, coming back also to what sort of properties we would be aiming for, this should ideally be configurable, right? So you should be able to say, you know, what sort of, for example, for an application like status, um, well, it might be, I don't know, if we have a chat between Oscar and myself going back and forth, it's not acceptable to have like five minute delays, right? But maybe for other applications or industrial use cases, it's totally okay to have five minutes, uh, like when we sign some important deal between, between both of us, it just doesn't matter. Because how would we do it today? We would send a letter and it would take a few days and, and we're just fine with that. So that's, that's a trade-off that I think we could live with and that's, that's important to generally be aware of. So the party who's deciding on um, the trade-off is the application developer, right? I mean, I, ideally, it should be configurable at runtime that we have basically settings that we can say, um, yeah, what, what, what am I willing to do, right? So ideally, this should be uh, configurable either at, at runtime or at, um, by, by the application developer, yeah. Uh, another thing, I think, so, so, so in terms of providing uh, privacy by default, uh, the way we look at it, status, we're trying to create sort of like on the order of seconds to actually have usable instant messaging. Um, so two points. One, one is um, one thing that's different, sort of, about mixed networks now versus a couple of decades ago is I think this this realization, this development that bandwidth is a lot cheaper. So it used to be the case that you sent it to some some mail server, or whatever, and then you had to wait six hours to actually get it there. Uh, but with sort of faster internet and, and so on, people are sort of using this this ba bandwidth parameter, sort of tweaking it and having cover traffic and so on which is what has brought the latency way down and where it's actually more competitive with something like Tor. So you can actually get reasonable anonymity or, or privacy on, on the order of seconds. Um, another aspect in terms of this, this tunability is that if you have privacy by default, so for example, in, 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 the, in the status app, the way we have sort of certain limitations uh, in terms of packet size and so on, 
but you can still do interesting things with that. So, so we have uh, an extensions component where if you want to send images, you essentially send like a, like a hash to IPFS or Swarm or whatever, and this can be sort of an opt-in mechanism where you can get these sort of more user-friendly stuff, but it's, it's sort of private, private by default, and then if you want uh, bells and whistles, you can add on top of it. And the same thing if you want to have real-time communication or anything like this, it's some, something you opt into. Um, and having it be private by default is, is very important because it's sort of, you're helping other people by, by sort of being part of this anonymity set. So you, and this is also where usability comes in and it kind of becomes tricky with certain trade-offs because uh, you want to have maximum security, maximum privacy and so on, but you also want to have good usability because if you don't, you don't actually have many people using this protocol uh, and that means that the anonymity set is reduced. So that's another sort of very important thing to think about. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, I think the way to think about it is your anonymity set is the amount of possible people that this could be, uh, you know, sit, sending this message or receiving this message. And uh, you want that to be as large as possible. So you want as many different people. If, you, if I make it a, a, a perfectly cryptographically deniable, like really great cover traffic mixed network system that's, you know, Whisper 3.0, but it's just like I'm sending messages to Sebastian. It's kind of pointless, right? Because everyone knows that it's me and Sebastian talking, even though everything in the middle is like this weird black box. Um, so you really, what, one thing you, you really want to do is you want to get as many uh, people using um, the system as possible. And, and anonymity basically is built on uh, company. It wants more people using it. And I think the interesting question for Whisper is, how, you know, there's different constraints. Important traffic can be kind of slow. Maybe other traffic needs to be faster, like instant messaging traffic, cryptocurrency traffic, so separate class. Uh, can we get all these different classes of traffic running through the same kind of decentralized peer-to-peer -peer anonymous routing infrastructure? I think that's a really interesting question. What trade-offs, is that even possible? What trade-offs are there? And, and, and is that possible? And that's why ultimately something like Whisper, has to be a sort of common infrastructure between not just status, not just the NIM project, not just validity, but ha it ideally is a common infrastructure shared between many, many different projects and everyone, it's not a zero sum game, everyone wins. And the great thing about it is the more people that use an anonymous uh, overlay network, the less fake traffic you have to have. If you have tons of real traffic coming in, if you're just hammering that network with new real traffic, then you don't need to generate so much dummy traffic. You don't need to generate so, many, so much fake traffic. So it's kind of, a, it's actually, it's a little bit of a win-win there if we can get more people using the infrastructure. If it cannot tell the different applications apart based on the traffic fingerprint. <laughs> Well, this is the Which is a yeah. really hard problem. Really hard problem. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, there's some work that has been done there. So for our implementation, we use this Sphinx package format, for example, which tries to, to address some of this, right? So that, like, a simple example would be, uh, I think we discussed this before, the message size, right? So if all of you are sending Ethereum messages, just like some normal Ethereum transactions around, which are a few hundred byte in size, and then Harry and myself are sending each other emoticons, right? Like three character things plus a header. And it's pretty trivial to identify ourselves. But yeah, if you, if you basically have a package format that protects kind of the, the size of the message as well as the header, um, then you can, you can solve a lot of, a lot of these issues um, around any sort of metadata that is associated to the package itself. Yeah. Just briefly. Uh we talk about sort of secure messaging more broadly as well. Like you can look at uh, privacy as a security feature, but you can also kind of look at something like sensor persistence as a security uh, feature. And this is maybe a bit below. It's more on the sort of network P2P layer. Uh, but something which Tor does very well is they have sort of this concept of pluggable transport, which means that even in sort of more lockdown countries or internet infrastructures, you can you can sort of um, communicate even and sort of guard against deep packet inspection as well. So if you can provide that kind of thing, that means that you can't actually censor communication, which I think is kind of one, another aspect of secure uh, communication as well. Yeah, and so, so what pluggable transports do is it sort of says, you know, you may actually be using this cool whisper protocol, but we're gonna make that traffic look like HTTPS traffic over TLS 1.2, so we can't distinguish it. And that's, that's, that's really useful. Um, I, I do wanna point out that 
that Whisper ends up being incredibly important and mixed networks in general um, because effectively there's been tons of work on zero knowledge proofs, et cetera, et cetera, on the chain. But, you know, in the, in the, in the threat model for all of this is that quite sensibly everyone gets a copy of this friggin' chain and so that any like halfway decent chain analytics company can just like walk through the, the currency, tran be, the currency uh, transactions. But, I mean, what we do know from the Snowden revelations and everything else is that in, it's been many years that this capability is becoming increasingly easy to access, is that actually just capturing all the traffic in and out of a server, such so as capturing all the traffic in and out of a signal server, capturing all the traffic that, to, for example, to Bitcoin seeding nodes or whatever, this is all really, really possible nowadays by, by, by adversaries. So even though there's not like a record of all the peer-to-peer -peer traffic that gets sent through, someone could be making that record. In fact, someone probably is making that record. So you need this level zero networking protection provided by a kind of new version of Whisper based on mixed nets. Or effectively, it doesn't really matter if you're using something like Zcash or Ethereum has these cool ZK snarks because the fact of the matter is you've just de-anonymized yourself by sending a peer-to-peer -peer broadcast. Yeah, I think in the Ethereum context of things, this is really important, really. I mean, we're talking about, well, that I, I, I see two discussions, right, which we, which we had and which start being solved in the Ethereum ecosystem right now. And the first one is that, okay, we, we should have some sort of privacy on, on chain. We've seen the first implementations of privacy preserving um, tokens recently, which I found really cool. And the second thing is we also realized it's not such a cool idea if everybody just uses Ethereum through MetaMask, which connects to the default Infura node, right? And, and people have, have acknowledged that, and some people are working on, on having more distributed nodes out there, but we need to have, we need to have at the core level the ability to, well, shield yourselves from some adversary that observes and says, hey, we have this person that is again interfacing some other Ethereum node, and we see a certain size of a transaction going out, and therefore it is quite likely that you are probably playing CryptoKitties right now, right? And if CryptoKitties is censored in some place, you will probably run into some real-world issues. So, I mean, this, this sort of, of base level security uh, for any sort of applications, even if we have all this fancy crypto stuff on top, I think it's really important to, to get in there. Okay, I think Oscar wants to make one last point, and then maybe you want to ask some questions. Yeah, so I think uh, beyond sort of the protocol and specification of it and so on, it, it's really important to look at the whole picture. So, when it comes to real humans and uh, sort of the privacy guarantees they get, so... I'll give you a few examples. So, so one is in the status of example, we're sort of using Whisper and it's sort of an easy marketing claim to make that, oh, Whisper is, is dark and provide privacy and so on. But it's, it's a bit dishonest uh, because it doesn't take into account actual reality and how people use, use that and so on. So, for example, in order to get offline messages, you actually need to have a direct TCP connection with a so-called mail server, which sort of replays messages for you. And there's lots of other examples like that. For example, most of us probably look at F FSCAN, right? And, and it, if you do that, then you're tying your IP to transactions. And this is something that I think Peter at the foundation has been talking about. And there's lots of these types of things. When you're just bringing up, out your phone, phone out of your pocket, you actually leak a lot of metadata. So there's a lot of work um, that goes on that, that has to be done in terms of being rigorous about what, what uh, guarantees we provide that aren't just on sort of the protocol specification level, but also in terms of real world usage. Um, and when it comes to sort of things like um, uh, light nodes and these types of things, lots of people use MetaMask and Infura and FSCAN and so on. Uh, we actually have a fun little experiment. It's called Chaos Unicorn Day, uh, where the idea is that uh, we're going to shut down uh, access to all sort of man and mill attack centralized services for one day and sort of see how things work. So that means Infura, uh, our cluster, which means sort of our boot nodes will disappear, FSCAN, and all these kind of web 2.0 uh, centralized services. And that's going to be April the 1st. So if anyone in teams out here uh, who actually believe in decentralization and want to build uh, better systems, uh, feel free to reach out to me and you can participate and sort of see what breaks and, and actually make this thing a uh, reality and not just sort of on paper. Okay, so up to now we learned there's some really cool ideas out there for anonymous decentralized messaging 
And we can use systems like MixNets that have been around for a long time and are well researched. But the key challenge is we're now decentralized. We do no longer want to cheat with having centralized services. And we're in a highly dynamic environment where people disappear and might appear again, which poses a couple of challenges that all of these people want to solve in the next couple of months and year. So if you have any questions, remarks, anything you want to do, now is the time to, sp uh, to speak up. So any questions? Yes. I wasn't quite clear if there is actually a coordinated Whisper 2.0 or whatever ABC XYZ uh, project between all of you folks, or if it's actually individual projects. Yeah, Can you so, so I, I think it's a misnomer to call whatever this effort uh, is uh, Whisper 2.0. So there's a sort of separate Whisper specific intern effort uh, that's ongoing uh, because there's sort of incompatibilities between clients and so on, and it sort of it needs proper spec. So that's one thing, which is in terms of improving Whisper as it stands. And then I think uh, a lot of teams sort of just organically, like we had Web3 Foundation, Status, and Evaluate Labs, uh, like we were uh, in NIM as well, uh, all looking at this problem and coming to the general conclusion that some mixnet based approach would probably be the best in terms of privacy guarantees and scalability because of sort of recent things that have happened in academia and so on. And then various products were sort of in different stages. So Web3 Foundation had a bunch of uh, researchers that have been looking into this for a long time. Valid Labs already had sort of an implementation. And from Stan's point of view, we were just starting to sort of look into these things. And now it's kind of some, like a collaborative effort where we had a workshop in Brussels a month ago and we also have a public Riot channel that you can join if you want and a GitHub repo. So, so what was that workshop called or, and what is the Riot channel called, for example? Is there, is there a name? Yeah, do we have, uh, it's, so Sorry. I think if you search for web free messaging, okay. uh, you'll find a blog post on your web free foundation or status. Okay. And then cool. it's GitHub uh, W free F slash messaging. Right. And then the Riot channel is something similar. And we, we're looking for more teams to join because this is an important part of the infrastructure and it's not just for Ethereum and it's not just for Web3, it's any, any people who believe in sort of this peer-to-peer -peer decentralized privacy uh, space, right? So we want to make it as, as sort of accommodating as possible. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, before I, I sold my soul to the blockchain, um, I used to work at a standards body, the World Wide Web Consortium, and at works, still continue to work with the IETF, we're doing a lot of messaging work. So, I mean, our interest is that eventually, maybe we don't call Whisper, maybe we call it something else, I don't really care, but I would really like to see a unified spec or set of specifications with a very clear interoperability around this work. And maybe some areas are more experimental, you know, and some areas are less experimental, but we should be able, I think, within the next year or so, to standardize a core functionality. Because I think we kind of agree on the general design, but, you know, devil's always in the details. Thank you, that answers it. Yes, of course. Um, I've thought a lot about the deniability problem in the past, and this is my take on it. Um, if you really want, yeah. <laughs> I really have nothing to say. <laughs> I'm disappointed. You haven't even heard the question yet. Um, if you really want bulletproof deniability, like you basically have to send every possible message. So if we're communicating in one bit messages, I have to send you both one, which is correctly signed, and zero, which is incorrectly signed. And then the problem with this, obviously, is that the message size grows exponentially, but for short messages and with compression, you, you may be able to, to handle that. Um, it, it seems there's a paper, uh, Ron Rivas paper from like the 1980s, where he talks about uh, winnowing and chafing. Um, it's a very short paper. He's trying to solve a different problem, but he fundamentally comes to the same, uh, same conclusion. Anyway, I'm just curious, I mean, do you think something that extreme is like realistic for short text messages or is it, is that hopeless? I mean, you talk about like the, the send the, send everyone, everyone, send everyone, everyone's message basically. Send everybody, everyone's message, that model. Well, it doesn't have to be everybody. It's just, if you and I want to communicate mm -hmm. in, a, in a deniable way, and let's say we're communicating with eight bit messages, that's, that's two to the eighth was like 256. I need to send all 256 possible messages to you. 
Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think, I mean, you know, I, you could do that, right? I think a lot of the research area, a lot of the area that we're trying to do is trying to make things really efficient. And a lot of deniability that, like, people want out of what we're doing is cryptographic deniability. So they also sort of say, well, how do I, you know, how do, how do I make sure that, you know, this sort of signature can't be linked to me? And so there's a little bit of a, I think, I think there's, there's like, a lot of the problems on deniability, and this is work that I think uh, Nick Unger and other people have been looking at, is the, the approach, it, it, it's a little, cryptographic deniability is a little bit different than like sort of like this sort of overarching holistic concept of deniability of any, me who did this message really come from? And connecting these is also pretty tricky as well. So at, at ITF we've viewed it as out of scope, but we're interested in it. Uh, Harry, do you want to talk briefly about this paper that you just wrote about the sort of high, uh, risk users. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so there, there's this, there's this uh, paper we wrote at Enria uh, where we actually there's network level deniability, but there's also deniability uh, between users and saying, well, you know, so the, the classic example is off the record messaging. It's deniable and cryptographically, and that's great, and uh, it's it's a good protocol. Uh, it's a bit gaining its its time age, but it's it's it still maintains its security properties, uh, but. The fact of the matter is what we discovered, we did 90 interviews, but most of the people who are what we call high risk users, is people in Russia, Syria, Ukraine, but also pretty well known people like Chelsea Manning, right? So Chelsea Manning used OTR to communicate to Adrian Lama and be like, oh, by the way, I happened to leak this stuff. And then, you know, when it actually got to court, <laughs> You know, the, the fact that, oh, you used OTR, how do you really prove it's Chelsea Manning? Well, that didn't really hold up in court. So I think uh, my general take on deniability is that it probably is more, less of a cryptographic problem, and more of like a kind of network level problem, uh, if you want to have that property. So, yeah, I was, um, I had a question regarding the, s the storage requirements uh, when sending messages to peers that might be offline in the network. So I was wondering, because uh, we, we briefly touched on this, like when you discussed about sneaker, net, uh, sneaker nets and when you discussed about, you know, this protocol about negotiating uh, av availability up front and, and so on and have it percolate down to, to the way, to the protocol itself. Uh, how are you thinking about when a peer is down, when a peer is offline, uh, how do we store that message? Where do we store it? What happens? Can we negotiate a front if like a period uh, in which that message is going to be stored? And, if, and as, as well, can we aggregate messages so that, you know, once the peer is down for a long time, we compile those messages and just send them as one? Uh, you know, all these patterns that yeah emerge as well, you know, in enterprise settings. So there are a number of enterprise systems, Kafka and so on, that, you know, have been dealing with yeah. similar requirements and... Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a good question. I think it's, it's there's several parts. So, so one level is sort of, I, th I think it, it's probably best to think of the mixnet design as kind of uh, stateless. So it, it might sort of store ephemeral messages in some, in order to sort of have uh, cover traffic and so on. But I think uh, in terms of Accounting for resources. You have on, on the one hand, you have sort of you have to pay for re relaying and so on, and then paying for offline storage and so on. And if you have a data synchronization layer on top, then it's actually the nodes themselves that store it. And then you might want to have some sort of helper nodes that also help store it, and they, they can get paid for it. But that's kind of like a separate payment mechanism. Uh, and then essentially within some sync, sync group, you you have these messages, and then you can con construct a DAG and may maybe some kind of rolling buffer where you request all the messages and, and essentially with the DAG, like you have message dependencies. So if in a group chat, you have pointers to the previous messages uh, and so on. But, but in terms of precise storage requirements, I think that depends on um, the group context. And also if you have very large uh, groups, then, then uh, the DAG can grow quite big. Uh, this is uh, matrix experience because they have a similar approach. And I, I think that's an open, open question. Yeah, let me just quickly add to that. Initially, I would say, okay, that's actually living on a separate layer from the communication protocol. It's just a separate protocol or, or application. But then again, if one, once we started bringing in incentives, it was actually, well, I have an incentive to relay a message to you. If I make money on that, I have an incentive to, to hope that you come back online, right? 
So thereby, you basically, you, you, I am basically now incentivized to store to some extent. Well, how long? Well, it's it's kind of a supply and demand question. How much does it cost me to store versus like how much are you? Uh, am I going to be paid for you being online? So th that's some of the interesting uh, aspects that you do gain by having an incentive layer in it that does require the receiving party to actually receive and confirm um, the reception of some package. Yeah, I'm just sealing this mic for now. That's good. I guess we are running out of time. So I did not ask you guys before if you have prepared closing statements. Does anyone want to make a closing statement that sort of rounds up the panel? Uh, so this is very ad hoc, but, but I, I mean, I think this is very important infrastructure. And one thing I've noticed um, is that there are lots of different projects and they're sort of trying to create their own solution and everyone has their own sort of perfect idea of how things should work and so on. I think it's really important that we collaborate on this because it's a critical piece of infrastructure. And, and if people are using the same network, uh, that's better for an image set, it's better for an open specification and the chance to actually create something that will live on beyond us and beyond any company, beyond any specific contributors or service or whatever. So if you're interested in this space, uh, please come and, and join us and, and collaborate in this, this effort. And like, it's very early days and there's lots of things to, to work on. And it's, yeah, I really encourage people to, yeah, come into contact with us and sort of make this thing a reality and let's, let's build an open specialization uh, together. Yeah, and if you're interested in uh, helping uh, the NIM project, uh, we will probably be uh, hiring fairly soon. We already have a dev team, but we're looking to expand. So if any developers are really excited by mixed networking, uh, we would like for people to get, it, get in touch. And I think that it's probably the most exciting project, in my opinion, in the entire space, because to be honest, very, you know, very few people are really looking at level zero networking protection and everything else is built on top of it. So if we don't get it right, we don't improve it, all the higher level infrastructure, which everyone seems to be more excited by all these dApps and whatnot, will all sort of be screwed in the long run. Yeah, uh, let me add that we will have a talk on Thursday at 12.15 in this room. So Thursday at 12.15, shameless plug here uh, to talk about the specific properties, implementations, and uh, if Robert needs a little bit less sleep, then we will also have a demo. Um, so to show how decentralized, anonymous, privacy preserving and incentivized messaging could actually work in practice. Okay, great. So I hope you got a good overview on what is going on with regard to this burnt anonymous messaging. And you heard all the advertisements about people looking for new people to work with, about talks that will go into details on some of the uh, existing constructions. And with this, we're going to give over to the next talk, which I have no clue what it is about, so I can't announce it. <laughs> okay, thank you guys.